Good morning. My name is Pastor Pete Jansen, and I'm the pastor here at Harborview Christian Church. Welcome to Sunday morning service. Uh, we are excited about uh, all that God is doing, uh, even in the midst of all of the craziness in this world uh, these days. So uh, we're, without further ado, we're going to just jump right into the, the message for this morning. And so would you join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, Father, that we have your word to consider, to look at, to study, to digest, to apply to our lives. And we pray that we would do these things and all the more for your glory and for your purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please join me in opening your Bibles to John chapter 15. John 15. We are starting in verse 9. That's where we left off last week. Uh, starting up in verse 9 of John chapter 15. And um, I just wanted to start out with a, a few comments in that I, I believe and I've had this drilled into my head over and over again uh, for most of my life, the, fr the simple phrase, nothing is for free. Nothing is for free. A statement that, that has just been ringing in my head uh, when I see an advertisement for a new product, uh, free, or an offer on the internet, or a pitch on a phone call, there's a price for everything. It clearly shows itself in the fine print and it's realized when a random bill comes in the mail. Can, uh, can you see that I've actually been caught in this trap in the past? <laughs> Maybe you have too. Yeah. I can honestly say, however, that there is one true free thing for us in this world. And that is the price that Jesus paid for us on the cross. But even in that, our response to what Jesus did carries with it a responsibility of faith and of obedience and the charge to pass the message on to others. But uh, more on that later. The author of John picks up the dialogue of Jesus with his disciples on the last night before his crucifixion in what is called the Upper Room Discourse. And we find this uh, continuing on in chapter 15 and verse 9. He's pouring into them everything he wants them to know before he leaves the earth. For instance, back in chapter 14, he was reassuring them of his peace. We find in 14, 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And here in chapter 15, we find him building on the assurance, beginning in verse 9, where he says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Think of that for a minute. God's love. What comes to mind when you think about God's love? Jesus wasn't just simply saying that the Father loved him and he loved the disciples and the disciples loved each other. No, actually he was saying, I love you the same way that my Father loves you. Jesus loves us in the very same way that God loves us. So it begs the question, how much do you think God loves Jesus? In Matthew chapter 3, we read in verse 16, When Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened up to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. God called Jesus beloved, and he said that he was well pleased with him. 
When you think of God's love, do you think of him loving you like that? Jesus is saying here, I'm loving you the same way my father loves me. As the father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. Isn't that an incredible concept to begin with uh, this Sunday morning? Remember the word abide from last week's study. Abide in my love means to live in my love, to rest in my love, to, to be comforted in my love, and to remain in my love. I think we would all agree that it's easier said than done, isn't it? Life has a way of pressing us into degrees of love that fall short of abiding in God's love fully. It can seem like everything is pulling us away from the love of God. And it's not just the circumstances of the day that draw us away. It's the inner conflicts we find that can really do the most damage. What do I mean by inner conflicts? Well, those familiar sins that we struggle with. For one, relationships gone bad, insufficiencies that tug at our self-worth, impatience with God's timing, insecurities, and one that I think we all can struggle with uh, even more so than the ones I've just mentioned, believing lies about ourselves rather than the truth that God says about us. Because if we were to abide in his love, it would produce peace and joy in us. How often in our day are we filled with peace? And can we say that as we live life, that we're joyful continually? What's the answer? Well, the Bible says right here in our verse, abide in my love. Be aware of God's love and provision in our lives. Let the object of our love be Jesus because he loved us first. If we abide in his love, all of life comes under that expression of love. Remember back when you first fell in love with Jesus? There was a joy that welled up inside of you that was inexpressible. There was a peace that, that lifted all the burdens that you had off of your shoulders. Was that meant to just be a one-time experience or... Is that life as God meant for it to be? Abide in my love. How? Well, the very next verse, verse 10, gives us that answer. Take a look at verse 10 in John chapter 15. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Jesus modeled for us what he wants us to do. In other passages of scripture, he says, do as I say, not as I do. Oh, no, 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 wait. No, that's not right. Matthew 16, verse 24, it says, Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. John 12, 26 says, If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. And then in John 8, uh, verse 12, again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. It's pretty clear here. Jesus wants us to follow in his footsteps. Remember WWJD and all of the promotional and all of the materials and all of the stuff that went along with that? Bottom line is that's not such a bad idea to keep in mind. What would Jesus do? Follow in his footsteps. Look again at verse 10, if you would, for a minute. It says, if 
you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. It seems that Jesus is telling his disciples, here are the conditions for following me. Oh, okay, well, here it is, the fine print, the price that we have to pay. Um, I, it seems as though it says, I'll love you as long as you're obedient, but the moment that you're disobedient, you can forget about me loving you anymore. Well, that's not what Jesus was saying. He gave his disciples an important principle to help preserve their faith, to stay close to him, to be fruitful, and to be obedient. He was actually saying, if you stay close in my love, you will be obedient. His love is not a result of obedience, but rather our obedience is the result of our love for him. Let me say that again. His love is not a result of our obedience, but rather our obedience is the result of our love for him. The, the idea of, of loving him gives us the idea that, yes, I'll do anything for you, Jesus, because I love you so much. Jesus is saying, I love you to the moon and back. And our response is, I love you too, Jesus. What can I do that I can show you that love? Anything that you want me to do, I'd be happy to do it. We love him, therefore we obey him. In other words, we don't obey Jesus so that we can get in good with him and get what we want. We're driven to obey Jesus by a heart that is filled with gratitude for the way that he pulled us out of this world and poured his love over us. You can understand the difference when you think of a parent-child relationship. Some of us were raised with the understanding that we either keep the rules or we get a beating or we're punished. But there were others of us uh, that uh, we knew that we were loved and we kept the rules because of that love. Well, in the next verse, verse 11, Jesus looks at the subject of joy. Let's look at verse 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. You know, in Isaiah chapter 53, we read that Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He knew pain more than anything that we've experienced. Yet beyond the pain and the sorrow and the afflictions and the humiliation was someone who demonstrated genuine joy. Speaking of Jesus' legacy to us, we weep, we may endure pain, we may be crushed by the experiences of life, but in the depths of our hearts and souls, there should be a spirit of joy. The source of our joy is Jesus. It says that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. One commentary puts it this way, nothing sets a Christian apart more than the joy they exhibit in spite of their circumstances. And Jesus says, that my joy may be in you. Where is Jesus' joy coming from? Well, think about it. Jesus knew that he was going to the cross. He knew that he was going to suffer great sorrow and, and anguish and pain. But what was, the, what was the result beyond that? He knew that he was going home. He knew that the cross was the way that he was moving to be able to eventually be sitting at the right hand of the Father and have his glory fully restored to him. The glory that he enjoyed with the Father from eternity. That's the joy that he shares with us. So do you see the bond or the connection between love and joy 
the Father's love for us, Jesus' love for us, the love we have for the Father and Jesus, and the love that we have for each other. This produces joy in us that remains and is full and complete. We don't have to stir up joy or manufacture it or pre pretend that, to be joyful. It's Jesus' joy that remains in us. It's from him. He's the source. Well, then Jesus, in verse 12 in our passage, uh, he circles back around to love. Let's look at verse 12 and 13. He says, this is my command that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You know, it, um, it sounds good when Jesus talks about he and the Father loving us, but this is a much more difficult statement to digest. Okay, he's saying, now you know how much I love you, Go and love others the same way and to the same degree. This is where I need the help of the Holy Spirit to, because it's beyond me to be able to love others as much as Jesus loves me. He loved me when I was unlovely, when I was broken, missing parts, selfish, stained with sin against him. And then... He goes on in verse 13, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. The greatest love someone can show a friend is to lay down their life for that person, to sacrifice everything because of that person. That's the model Jesus left us with. He sacrificed everything on our behalf. And he loves us that deeply. But notice here Jesus' reference to friendship. Chuck Colson, when he was released from prison, gave a speech at an Ivy League school. And as he began his address, a group of students began to heckle him and interrupt his speech. They shouted, how could you have defended Richard Nixon? And Colson looked at the at the hecklers, and he said, I defended him because he was my friend. And immediately, all of the other students stood on their feet and they began applauding because they recognized a trait in Colson that is not often found in politics and probably something they desperately were looking for themselves the importance of relationships and standing by a friend, no matter what. Jesus continued with this theme of friendship in verse 14. He said, he makes the statement, you are my friends if you do what I command you. In other words, I have been your rabbi, your teacher. You have been my disciples, my students. You've been in my school, but today is graduation day. And from now on, I want you to look at me as a friend. A boyfriend of Doreen's daughter, Gabby, was talking with Gabby on the phone one day when he heard Doreen in the background. And he said to Gabby, tell your mom, hi, Doreen. And Doreen said, oh, no. No, no, he doesn't get to call me Doreen until I get to know him a little bit better. It's Mrs. Galesco for now. Later on, as they continued to date, Doreen told him, it's okay to call me Doreen now. And he goes, um, I can't do that, he said. When, maybe when you get married and become Mrs. Jansen, well, may, maybe then, maybe that'll be okay. It's interesting, he learned respect and he learned appropriate behavior and, uh, and later on that in fact did happen. So Jesus explains in verse 15, no longer do I call you servants 
For the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. Jesus showed his friendship for the disciples by telling them everything, the deep things his father had told him. A master does not confide in a servant. That's a true friend when he confides everything. He learned an important lesson that day, Chris did, about respect and friendship. But here's the reality, even though we have his peace, his love, and his joy, we have to also participate in what he receives from the world. Look at verses 18 and 19. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. We naturally want to share with others what we get excited about. But when it comes to sharing our faith in Christ, even the most excited new believer soon learns that hostility to Christ is deeply rooted in this world. This world hates the things of God. This world hates Christ. Unbelievers can tolerate Jesus as long as he's a stripped down version that's not offensive to their way of life. But if you show the real Christ, the biblical Christ, and declare your faith in him, you very well can be despised by this world. It shouldn't be a surprise that when people come to Christ and expect their lives to be happy and carefree, that they're in fact saddened and mistaken when the persecution begins. Often from family and ones who, who love you the most. Jesus said, remember the words that I said to you, verse 20. Remember the words that I said to you, a servant is not greater than their master. If they persecute me, they will also persecute you. We need to continue to pray for and witness to loved ones and others. The hope is that they'll come to find Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But we have to expect that some will reject everything and reject us for offering it. And if they reject him, remember, a servant is not better than their master. And then finally, Jesus touched on the Holy Spirit again in verses 26 and 27. He says, but when the helper comes, the Holy Spirit, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. The Holy Spirit would both testify of Jesus and empower the disciples to testify of him in the face of the world's most hatred and the, the hostility and the persecution. This has been going on for 2,000 years and continues with Christians around the world witnessing for Christ. So back to the question, is there a price for being a Christian? As the old hymn says, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. There is a price to be a Christian. And Jesus paid that price in full. It's out of love for him that we endure a time of troubles of the, in these days, that we abide in him, that we are obedient and, and not serving him out of compulsion, but out of a love for him. And the price 
that he has paid for us. These things are so important that we get it right and that we as believers in Jesus Christ would understand his great love for us and as we in turn love him, our desire is to do anything and everything in our power to serve him and be obedient to him and to witness that to others in a powerful way. The power is in Christ and using our lives as a platform to be able to declare that power and that authority and that peace and that love and that joy. I pray God's blessing on you this week. I pray that he would give you the ability to be able to share your faith, to be able to declare the truth of God's word to others because of your great love for him. Would you please pray with me? Father God, you have demonstrated your love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What an incredible depth of love. Love for a friend. Father, we praise you and we thank you that your grace and your mercy and your love and your peace and your joy is ours and that you have paid the price for it all. We rejoice in that and we declare, Father, our desire to be obedient to you and to your word because we love you. We rejoice in you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day and enjoy this week. We look forward to seeing you next week at the farm. God bless. Bye-bye.